Well, 18 trillion is 60 percent of GDP, 64 percent of GDP. We could pay it off with eight months of our work is another way of saying it, right? If we took everything we earned in the next eight months, we could pay off real debt. Can we afford it? Of course we can afford it. I've always said the issue is not can we afford it, is are we getting our money's worth? That's the real issue. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Good morning, everyone. I I have to say, I Peter and I have done this many, many times, and there's some of these conversations that I've read their Lineman report, and it's got so much data in it. I'm trying to kind of find my theme. Uh, today is one of those days that I have an abundance of questions for Peter. Uh, so many of the things that Peter has said are coming true, happening, what have you, and we'll run through all that. He, like anyone, is going to get some things not exactly right, but it's just fun to see it all happen. We'll talk about this morning's CPI print and some other things. I want to do a little housekeeping before we dive into the discussion, though. First thing, Peter's in my last discussion in Philadelphia, which we did live, and to anyone in New York, Peter and I are going to do our next quarterly update in New York live in, uh, I guess it's October. So um, be on the lookout for an invitation to come listen to this discussion live in New York in October. But our last one has been viewed by 267,000 people on YouTube. Um, it's a pretty incredible number. It's a record for Peter and me. Um, and I would just say to everyone who tunes into this, um, if you enjoy this, Peter and I don't get anything from this. We do it because he's got such great research and uh, I and my company are so involved in these markets that it's just a, a great way for us to share knowledge uh, with people throughout the industry. Um, but if you enjoy this, forward the invitation to someone that you know who might enjoy it. Uh, if you watch it on YouTube on replay, forward the YouTube replay. And the final plug I would make is that while I try and do my best to summarize the Lineman letter uh, and pick out the most important piece to it, I obviously only scratch the surface. And uh, I would just make a plug that if you are in the real estate markets and you really want great research that gets down to the very, very micro level, um, subscribing to the Lineman letter is a great, great thing to do. Um, and so the final thing on housekeeping is that um, we receive hundreds of questions from people prior to the webcast. And Peter and I review those. Um, I rarely take specific questions and put them into my questions, but they are very helpful for me to understand what's on people's minds. And so I would just say, A, thank you for those questions. B, keep them coming. And C, thank you for not making snarky comments about my hair, my shirt, or the lack of insight in my questions to Peter. Um, next week, we are live from Sun Valley, Idaho. Uh, with my guest, Kirill Sokolov, who is the founder and CEO of 13D Research. If you think that Peter and I are going to review the real estate markets in depth today, tune in next week for that discussion. Kirill and his team and his fund invest across the market uh, and have had spectacular returns on everything from uh, oil to uh, uh, alternatives to uranium, to Greece, to India, and a bunch of other uh, themes that they follow and invest in very, very effectively. Um, after that, I've actually got Condi Rice that I'm interviewing next week at the Walker and Dunlop Summer Conference. We are not going to publish my interview with Condi Rice live next week. Unfortunately, uh, the former Secretary of State is very particular about publication of interviews that she does, um, but I'm very much looking forward to talking to Secretary, former Secretary Rice um, about everything from 9-11 to China to Ukraine to being the first female member of Augusta National. Uh, the final thing that I will uh, point out is that when we go to Peter on the screen, you will see that he is wearing a hat uh, that says Sam on it. Uh, Peter and I met thanks to Sam Zell. Um, and our friendship emanates from Sam and a conference that Sam has put on every year uh, during his life uh, until he died recently. Um, and Peter and I were just together with a bunch of our friends at that conference back at the beginning of June. And as, as was said at that conference, Sam Zell's impact on the commercial real estate industry is probably the most significant of anyone in the history of commercial real estate, certainly in the United States. 
Um, and whether it be from having one of the very first REITs uh, to his opinions on the market that many of you would watch and listen to on CNBC on a very consistent basis, um, Sam's insight in the market, his investments in the market, um, and quite honestly, his his training and upbringing of this generation of commercial real estate executives uh, is just profound. Uh, and so um, both Peter and I are both saddened by the loss of our friend Sam um, and this industry. Hopefully we'll continue to move forward in a great way, but it will clearly do so without the leadership of the great Sam Zell. Uh, a couple headlines as we dive in. Um, I was looking back at last year at this time and some of the things that Peter said, and I want to run through a couple of the headlines and then Peter and I will dive into them deeper. So here we go. Last July, Peter said, don't bet against the United States economy. And he was right. You said in your letter, um, we hope, you said in your current letter, we hope it that by the end of the summer, the Fed realize that they have misdiagnosed the station in the strength of the economy and finally cut rates. I will say ahead of time, keep on dreaming, Peter. Um, you said the reopening of China was crucial to the reduction of inflation, and you were right. Uh, you had 2023 GDP growth of 3.5% last July. You've now revised that to 2023 at 2.2%. You said the price of oil would come down last July, and it has fallen from $104 per barrel in July of last year to $75 as of today, down 35%. You said the consumer was still in good shape, and it remains so today. You said office occupancy would pick up. You were wrong. You stated in January of this year that 40 to 50 percent of U.S. homeowners refinanced their 30-year fixed-rate mortgage around 3 percent over the past several years, and that this would benefit the consumer and also restrict the supply of existing single-family homes in the for-sale market. This narrative that you identified in January of this year has been used extensively in May, June, and July to underscore what's going on in the single-family housing market. Um, you've highlighted student debt and the August 29th, 2023 date when the payment holiday ends. You state this quarter, the down payment squeeze that existed after the GFC has returned. You also state just because a computer says something doesn't mean that it is true. The final headline from this week, from this quarter's letter that I will state is, if you use a stat that Savills estimates that there is $811 billion of global real estate, private equity, dry powder sitting on the sidelines. And I sent that stat to Chris Mickelson, who runs investment sales at Walker and Dunlop. And Chris's response to me, Peter, was the following. The dry powder number is like my son's fish story. It keeps getting bigger and bigger, but harder and harder to find. So um, I want to dive in uh, on this. You got your CPI print this morning, Peter. Uh, Ten years has rallied 15 to 20 basis points. Um, I guess at the end of the day, you were right. You've been sitting there. You, you said to me this morning that the headlines are economists over predicted where inflation would be and were basically right in line with what you said it would be. Yeah, I mean, the inflation, it's a little like the oil story when we talked to back then. I didn't know where oil was going to exactly go back then, but it had to go down because of extraction costs versus, look, all you had to do, we've been through this, look through the data. Just look at the data. And you saw producer prices weren't rising. In fact, in some cases, were falling. You saw the supply chain issues were largely evaporating. There's still... Uh, places where there are some issues, um, you saw that the main driver of the inflation numbers were two things. One, they were doing year over year, and a year ago was very bizarre uh, during the first half of this year. And, and so when you were doing that mathematics, it was very bizarre math. And the second issue was that they were uh, ignoring what was happening now to housing. And housing is, a, as we've talked about, a big component of those indexes, a completely mischaracterized in terms of what's going on. So I'm going to do just real quick, off, off the last um, six months now, if you took the month over month CPI increase, 
and annualized it. And for those who are not real good at math, just multiply by 12, right? So as you annualize. So the last six months have been um, 1.3%, 1, 1 4.8%, 1.3%, 4.6%, and now 2.5%. What's the picture there over the last six months? And I, I don't want to get too precise, but what would you say? Three, two and a half, some number like that over the last six months. When you strip out the insanity of how they measure housing, it gets even lower. And we don't have time to go into it. And if you want to, we can. Um, but just, just note, all of you who own homes, you had no inflation on your home price. They pretend you did. Um, uh, on your on that, Peter, let, me, let me jump into that for a second, because last July, you stated a year from now, you will see normalized consumer price inflation with increased asset price inflation. Yep. That hasn't happened. Well, home prices are moving back up again in the last few months. Um, stock market has moved up again in the last few months. The bond yield came down. Now it's blipped back up. I don't know what it's done today with the CPI numbers. Um, the, the 10 so, years rally, the 10 years rallied by about 15, 20 basis points. Yeah. So that's that's a notable improvement on six months ago or a year ago uh, where we were at. So it's not an asset price explosion, but it's a leveling off. On real estate, it's hard to say because you've got people looking to make the bargain of a century and um, and owners of like multifamily who put a loan on seven year, uh, three years ago, cash flowing like mad as long as it was fixed, cash flowing like mad, they're not going to they're not going to go and sell into that. I mean, and so you you have a, a, an oddity going on. Um, and in fact, among the questions people ask, as you know, is what's cap rates and so forth. One other thing about inflation, though, is that we are take the numbers I just said. Those are not my numbers. Those are the numbers. And if you do it over the last six months, you come out to around 2.7% annualized inflation. The Fed keeps saying 2%, 2%, 2%, like it was handed down from Mount Sinai. It's a made up number. I don't know how else to say it. It's not derived from a study of what's optimal or it's a made up number. There's no difference between 2.5 and 1.5. There's no difference between two and three. There's a difference between three and 13, right? And um, but so they let's, are obsessed with nothing. So uh, the, 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 the odds are, I think the number that Steve Leisman gave on CNBC yesterday was right now, 92% of you know, the people they poll say that the Fed's going to raise again. Um, You've got, you know, we've had robust job growth, which seems to be the issue that continues to prowl us forward. You note 850,000 jobs in March, April, and May. And you project that the U.S. is going to add 2.7 million new jobs in 23, 3 million in 2024, and 2.5 million in 25. But the Fed is sitting there saying you need to get unemployment up to 5%. So, so these. The, you're saying we're Stupid adding is, they want to get in inflation down. W what gives? Too many levels of stupid give. Um, one, um, uh, there is no, let's start with one thing about interest rates and jobs. Okay. I'm going to do real fast math. State, local, and federal governments are roughly 35% of the U.S. economy. Okay. Just roughly. Okay, and by the way, healthcare is roughly 18% of the economy. Those two sectors alone are 53% of the US economy. Is anybody not gonna get a hip replaced because of interest rates? Is anybody not gonna get um, their glaucoma taken care of because of interest rates? Is anybody at the government not gonna get hired because of interest rates? I haven't seen the Fed letting go a lot of people. I mean, so you've got Without even, Willie, the only, there are other sectors, as you know, without even trying, you get 53% of the economy is interest rate insensitive. This is 
very different than when I was a little boy in the 1950s, where manufacturing was the main thing, et cetera, et cetera, and there was some degree of interest rate sensitivity. It's not the case today. Big government, big, big uh, medical, say over half of the economy is essentially interest rate sensitive. If you had a heart attack right now, are you going to go, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to go. They raised the interest rates 25 bips. Not going to happen. But so I, when I, you hear get- you, I, I hear you on that. I hear you loud and clear on that. And you've said that. And you've talked about, you know, you're, you're, you do not hold back on your wording in the Lineman letter as it relates to the stupidity that you believe is, is, is inside the four walls of the Fed uh, uh, board meeting. But so here's the issue, though. I mean, you write in the letter that you think that they will understand their stupidity by the end of the summer and start cutting rates. The forward curve, which, as you and I both know, had projected six weeks ago, a 413 Fed funds rate by the end of the year has now reverted completely back after reading the minutes of the last Fed meeting and is now looking at a 525 to 550 Fed funds rate by the end of the year. What leads you to believe and write that you think that they're all of a sudden going to figure out the wrongs of their policy and turn around and start cutting in a month or two? Because you're saying they they don't get it. And at the same time, you're saying they're going to do something. It. So what's the message they get that all of a sudden says, oh, we're heading in the wrong direction? Sooner or later, it is just so obvious. That's the real point. And I don't know. I mean, look. Think of it this way, Willie. We just talked about what inflation is. Forget year over year what it is happening in real time in the last six months. Way down, way down. Let's say 3%. Let's just take 3% is the rate it is right now. Why do you need a five and a quarter percent overnight rate on a safe thing? I mean, that's crazy, right? It should be 25 to 50 bips higher than inflation. And so when you've got it at five, and now you're saying take it from five, five and a quarter to five and a quarter to five and a half, you understand how distortionary. And, in, you know, it, it's interesting. I said it doesn't affect healthcare and it doesn't affect government. You know what it does affect? Anybody reliant on short-term money. Uh, you think banks might fall into that category? So what's going to happen if they raise rates? is they're going to just create more balance sheet issues at banks. So banks are going to let people go. Banks may go out of business. So we're going to adjust the entire economy by putting banks out of business. The Fed's not going to do that. It's it's a bizarre, bizarre approach to the world. It's and, And I don't, when I say I don't get it, people think I'm kidding. I don't get it. So, and, tip, and I said this in Lineman letter, and if you humor me, I'll say it again. I'm not saying they're evil people. I'm not even saying they're stupid people, although they try. But, you know, I take the example of the Super Bowl ads and smart people work all year long to create these dynamite Super Bowl ads. And at least half of them are such complete bombs that they never are replayed in any form after running on the Super Bowl, right? You go, how'd that happen? And the answer is groupthink. They fell into groupthink. Somebody thought it was cute. Somebody thought it was funny. Somebody thought it was impactful. They talked to other people who told them it was. And you come up with these disasters. And, you know, and I use the other example. There are a lot. But I don't think anybody who was planning how to execute the extrication from Afghanistan was ill-intended. I don't think anybody was trying to do harm. I don't think they sat around the meeting saying, you think we can get a, where we leave and people are hanging on to the undercarriage of planes. But they fell into groupthink. And smart people working hard delivered dumb results. And it is the danger of groupthink. It's the danger of insularity. All right, and my so, profession is subject to it. Yeah, no, I, I realize that. And, and and you make the good joke that you became a PhD economist rather than uh, because becoming a tarot card reader was 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 more challenging. Right, so let's go to this. Canaries, everyone always asks me when I read the unlimited letter, where is he on Canaries? So on Canaries, uh, you've got 50 
potential canaries in the entire analysis this quarter um, in the 45, because I'm going to take out one on stupid Fed policy because you're at four out of five dead canaries on stupid Fed policy. But the only other because I'm five, nice. Only because that? I'm nice. It's only four out of five. Because you're nice. It's four out of five. Exactly. You give them one still alive. But um, only five dead out of 45 across everything else that you track, which is great. But you've got two of five on speculative real estate development boom. Right. I, I, I the, so, and, okay. I, w- so, where are you seeing speculative real estate well, let, there investment three, boom there right three, now? Yeah, there are three little pockets. One is, as you know, there's a lot of office still being developed. And it's very high quality office. They're they're making um what would I call it? They're making a fair bet that even if the demand for office goes down, that the demand for high quality office will go up. So I'm not saying they're dumb in that. I'm just saying that's happening, right? And you see it in the data. The second place you see it, and I think you and I both were amazed is in multifamily, which is by definition speculative, right? Um, you don't have pre-leased. Um, and much to my confusion and amazement, multifamily starts instead of dropping further over, they rose. And I don't get it. I, I don't know if it's a data quirk. I, I don't know how it's possible. You talk to even more people in, this, in the industry than do I. I expected it to fall another, you know, another month and another month as the high interest rates squeeze out development. The only, I, I can't imagine how that spurred it up, but you still have a little bit too much multi. And the third is industrial. There's a fair amount of industrial spec. There's very strong demand. And it doesn't take long to build. So if you do overbuild, you shut the pipe down, pipeline down. But those are the three little pockets uh, of, of speculative. That's that's why I got a couple of debt. You don't have widespread. On your comment on um, development of office assets and kind of scratching your head on it, one of the data points I'd give you on that one, Peter, is that trophy assets right now, um, receive an average rent of $79.14 a foot, with Class A only receiving average rents of $40.65 in the United States. So there's there's almost a $40 discrepancy on a per square foot basis between trophy office and Class A office. And then don't even take a look at Bs and Cs. So to your point, there is a bet, and you said it's a calculated bet that's going on right now, of people saying, People want to be in new brass and glass and that they will pay to be there. When you and I were last in Chicago, I will. Um, I, I went from uh, uh, you and I doing this for a, for a, for a private group, uh, and I went to a meeting with a Walker Nellock client, and we were talking about office. And one of the executives spun around in his chair, and we we're looking out at the river in Chicago. And he goes, "Look, you go five blocks that way, and there's about five million square feet of office that should be condemned." and turned into something else. He goes, you go five blocks that way, and we're getting the highest triple net rents we've ever gotten in the history of Chicago. What's different about it? It's location, location, location. Now, there's a bigger play going on here. And one of the things I wanted to raise with you, Peter, is this. There are headlines every single day that commercial real estate is under siege. And um, I wrote an author on one of the articles the other day where they say commercial real estate values are down 30 to 40 percent. And then you read the article and they don't talk about anything other than office. office. I, wrote, I wrote the author and I said, either talk about all commercial real estate and all the asset classes or just focus on office. But commercial into right. just office is not uh, it's a misnomer. And so this is my concern. There's four point four trillion dollars of commercial real estate debt outstanding. Half of it is to multifamily. Um, but in the office space, about 19% of commercial debt outstanding is to offices. Okay, so it's like $750 billion. And from a conversation I had this morning with Jamie Woodwell at the Mortgage Bankers Association, something around $140 billion of that number is coming due in 2023. And so I sit there and I look at what Walker and Dunlop did in office financing in 2022, where we did $2.2 billion of office financing last year. We've done a whopping $140 million of office financing this year, $140 million. So if you've got $140 billion of office loans that need to be somehow worked out that are maturing in 2023, and someone like Walker and Dunlop 
is down that much, my question would be, where's the time bomb and when does it get worked out? Yeah, I mean, look, here's what I, I've been thinking about office a lot. Um, what happened is the historic relationship between job growth and absorption has been broken, right? Over the last four years, we have more jobs than four years ago, and we have less office uh, leased, and certainly much less office occupied at the moment. That broke. Now that didn't break in multi, right? That didn't break in industrial. That didn't break in hotel. I mean, it had a dip in hotel, but when you look. 19 to today, all those, the relationship still holds. If you're a lender, that's frightening because how do you underwrite when the historic relationship doesn't hold? Now, you may say, okay, I think it returns. You know, I think it returns, but that's neither here nor there. I can't back that up with data other than pre the last four years. That makes underwriting really hard. And remember, all lenders do at best is get their money back and an interest rate, right? So I can imagine entrepreneurs willing to take that bet that the historic relationship returns. Unfortunately, they want some debt. The debt providers are going, we can't underwrite. We don't know the relationship. Therefore, we don't know how big our problems are going to be. Back to that book you're just talking about. And some of that book, probably 20% of that book will very easily roll, right? I mean, they're well leased, they're great sponsors, and they're low loans compared to even whatever you might say value is today. And then you get to the rest where you just don't know. So, and I, I used this, this analogy, I think, with you before, Um it reminds me of the scene in Blazing Saddle where the sheriff comes into town. They're all ready to kill him because they don't want a black sheriff. And the black sheriff pulls out a gun and holds it to himself. And suddenly all the townspeople freeze and panic. The bankers are willing to are ready. The lenders are ready to kill the borrower right until the borrower takes out the piece of paper and says, it's yours. And there'll be a lot of workout. There'll just be a lot of extend and hope and hope certificates. Um, that's all I can see for the next year. And, and what really you need is transparency on what that relationship is between jobs and absorption. So on jobs, you, you have an extensive analysis in this letter about unemployment pre-COVID and unemployment today. And you, you focus in on a number of, of markets where we've seen a positive variance, if you will, or unemployment going down. Um, and you highlight Phoenix, Cincinnati, and Detroit, Miami, Kansas City, and Columbus as being markets that the unemployment level is lower in 2000 and in, in April of 23 than it was in February of 2020. And in markets like New York, where it's up 160 basis points, Vegas up 140 basis points, that they have higher unemployment rates today than they did pre-COVID. And I'm reading your data, Peter, and I go to myself, but hang on a second. San Antonio, Dallas, and Austin, and Houston all also have higher unemployment today than they did pre-COVID. And I said, There's, something doesn't give. So I went further into your data, and I looked at where payrolls have grown. And this right. data point I thought was unbelievable because Austin's payroll employment is up 15% since February yep. of 2020. Dallas is up 9.8, San Antonio 6.5, Tampa 8.7, Orlando 6.9. Interestingly, Miami is the laggard of employment growth in the state Correct. of Florida. It's only up 4.6%. Correct. And as I think the narrative with everyone knows, LA flat, New York City negative, DC negative, Portland negative, Pittsburgh negative, Minneapolis negative. And even Detroit, this was the one that you point out has a lower unemployment level today, but even there, their payrolls have gone down by 1.2%. Right. And so I guess my question to you is this. Um, is all the growth still happening in the Sun Belt? And as a real estate investor, do you chase that employment growth or do you look more at unemployment numbers because that is a better indicator of the local economic health? So there, what the answer is, 
there's like a hundred indicators of local economic health. That's why I report the unemployment rate and the employment growth and, and so forth, because you know, I, we talked about years ago, what I view looking at the economy, the economy that you might be investing in, it, it's like a um, Soro painting, right? It's a whole bunch of dots that left to themselves don't tell you much of anything. So the unemployment rate doesn't tell you a lot on its own, but you combine it with other stuff. So it starts mattering. And the, the trick of the unemployment rate is if I have 15% employment growth and 18% migration of people looking for work, the unemployment rate goes up, even though it's a pretty good labor market, right? That's kind of what you have to sort out through all this. So they're, they're all interesting metrics. Um, where's going to grow? Look, the best predictor statistically in the last 30 years, and I've studied this four different times, the best predictor of growth, um, yes, whether Yes, politics. Yes, uh, taxes. Yeah. The single best predictor of growth is growth. And and you say, well, that's kind of a cop out, but it's statistically true. Right. And you can't ignore that. It, so will the South continue to grow? Yeah. Um, can they hit turning points? Yeah. Take San Francisco. You know, San Francisco, historically, and Philadelphia have grown, I'm talking metropolitan areas, right? They have about the same growth patterns, historically. I'm not talking about in the last whatever. They both are very slow growth markets. Somehow San Francisco gets characterized as a fast growth market, and Philadelphia gets characterized as a slow growth market. They're both slow growth markets. They both have always been, or always in the last 30 years, been slow growth. So there's a lot of mis- you want a fast grow market? Go Houston, right? Go Dallas, go Atlanta, go uh, you know the, the Orlando, go to Vegas, um, and they they will continue to be. They will continue to be. The Miami one is headline mania, right? Like three guys move from the Upper East Side um, to one of, one of the, to, who's a very good friend of the two of us. Uh, yeah, and three guys move from the Upper East Side and from Chicago to uh, Miami, and it's suddenly headline-worthy, right? And um, did they move? Yep. Did it hurt where they left? Yep. Um, but they weren't everybody. They weren't everybody. There's always been people making that move. They're going to continue. And I'll take just for example, you know, um, Zell did not move out of Chicago. That didn't make a headline. Um, Ken Griffin did move out of Chicago. That made a headline. Yeah. And they're, they're both part of the reality. So um, you, you let's talk about the consumer for a second, because I think it's important in the context of job growth and, and GDP growth. Uh, you talk about the consumer still being in good shape. Credit card debt, auto loans, and mortgages, total household debt as a percentage of GDP is now at 71% in Q1 of 2023, which is slightly above the long-term average of 69%. And as a comparison point, well, well below the 99% in 2009, as we were in the midst of the GFC. Um, and you talk about the fact that there's a huge amount of cash that's still sitting in the economy, that the, the this massive inflate, in, in, in injection of M1 into the system um, has you know, $2.1 trillion of additional cash sitting out there, which as you explain in the, in the Lineman letter, Peter, right now household debt is only moderately at $18.3 trillion above household cash at $17.3 trillion. Isn't that, the the story? Don't know Isn't that the story of this economy? That there's yeah. so much cash circulating around that that's what continues to drive consumer spending? Yeah, and but, but think of it this way. Suppose you didn't know anything and we just started a conversation and I said, you know, the consumers have more, basically enough cash they could retire all their debt tomorrow as a group. They have tons of jobs available to them. They're all working if they want to work. Um, their wealth is higher than uh, three years ago, uh, four years ago, by about 3%, 4% per annum above inflation. 
um, their incomes are tracking above inflation over the four years. And um, they were able to lock in, 42% of them were able to lock in super, super, super low interest rates for the next 30 years. Does it surprise you the consumer's strong? That the consumer, now I'm not saying they're out of sight, but it doesn't surprise you. Um, are there cracks? There's always cracks. There's always people who can't pay their debt. There's always people who um, are going to lose their job and have a hard time finding a job, even in a booming labor market, right? There's always somebody who's going to be sick and struggling. That's not new. It's just that there are fewer of them. And it's not about Biden and it wasn't about Trump. It's about the dynamic nature of the U.S. economy. And I, you know, you've heard me say the U.S. economy is so good, even our politicians can't screw it up. And that's true. You know, I'm 72 and I've seen a lot of politicians come and go. I've seen a lot of Congresses. I've seen a lot of presidents. Even our politicians can't screw up our economy. They can dent it. They can you know, put a little dent in it. Uh, so, but the consumer's in good shape. The consumer's in good shape. You predicted accurately that the Supreme Court would rule that the Biden administration student loan forgiveness plan was going to be not unconstitutional. It was just a it, the HEROES Act didn't work for them to be able to change right. uh, the obligations. And they voted 6-3 on that. So we've now got a a, a trillion seven of student loan debt that is coming back online. And as I said at the top, August 29th is the day that the holiday is over. Um, you've said previously, good luck collecting it. Yeah. And I'd imagine that the government does a pretty good job of getting into the rating agencies and the consumer credit agencies and making it so that people have to start paying back their debt. I guess my question would be this, Peter. Had that amount of debt been wiped out, it probably would have had a pretty big impact on the rental housing market because all of that money would have been found money. And as you said, during the pandemic, people who got an inheritance early now had down payment money and could go do something. If all that debt had been wiped out, a lot of people who are renters today might actually have the opportunity to jump into single family ownership. Um, with the reinstatement of that, um, is that a is that a tailwind for multi just specifically as it relates to the to the balance sheet of individuals? Um, how, how does that play or, or does it end up tipping over some people in this relatively positive consumer outlook actually turns to the negative because of this burden? So first, I don't think most people are going to pay it. They haven't paid their loans for about three and a half years now. And I think it's a very, uh, this is behavioral psychology, which is not my field. I'm just kind of, um, I think it's very difficult to go to people who for three and a half years have not paid their loan and say, oh yeah, come Tuesday, start paying it again. But that, doesn't that just roll into your FICO score? score? I mean, don't they, don't they just go to the consumer rating agencies and say, if they don't pay it, you're, it's coming back here and your FICO score goes down? The government has to do it. And the government, by the way, how efficient are how efficient is the government in your dealings? I don't know about yours, but in mine, the <laughs> government has always been a horrible debt collector. Horrible. They were horrible on agricultural loans. They were horrible on student loans. There was a, there was a pitcher. I think his name was David Cohn. This goes back in time. He pitched for the Mets, and he owed debt. This is like twenty years ago, and they they there was a congressional hearing about you know, students not paying their loans, and they said they couldn't find these people. And he was one of the people they couldn't find. And then the congressman in a hearing plays the tape of him pitching at Chase Stadium that afternoon or something, right? They're not going to, are you, you're a congressman. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, you're up for election. The cycle is about to begin. Are you really going to turn a deaf ear? to people who haven't paid in three and a half years when they say we aren't going to pay when they're young voters. And there's a lot of them. Was it 24 million voters? I just think it's going to be a bit of a game of chicken. Now, there's going to be some they're going to pay. When you think about it, over half of the student loan is less than $20,000. So if we took 20000 as the number and you say 3% interest rate, you're talking about you know, 600 bucks of interest plus amortization. And, you know, you put on 
it's a, it's a number. It's not a staggering number. It's a number that says, okay, I cut back on my drug and alcohol consumption for a while. But, you know, I, I was that too? Was that too? Right. That, was a little, that was a little bit much. That was a little bit much. But anyway, let's go to a number that is a real number. Total Fed debt. Um, you and I have talked over the years extensively about the fact that we've added trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of debt since the Obama administration. And yet the federal debt service payment went down and down and down because we were in a lower and lower interest rate environment. Now, obviously, we're back up into a much higher interest rate environment. I think we paid $60.3 billion in interest payments in April. Um, and, and I was actually with a former Treasury secretary earlier this week and asked, how does the Treasury think about like Se sequencing the issuance of treasuries and whether you go with two years or five years or 10 years. And this former Treasury secretary looked at me and said, we just kind of issue what we think the market needs and wants. We don't really think about what the portfolio ought to look like. Obviously, if rates are lower, we go longer, but there's not a whole lot of you know, science that goes into that, which I have to say, I was a little amazed with that response. Um, but anyway, it's 30.5 trillion of total Fed debt outstanding. You point out 6.6 .6 trillion is intergovernmental. So that's net debt of 24 trillion. And then you point out that the Fed has another 5.9 trillion. So net net debt is $18.6 trillion. Is it- That's a less worrying number. Issue? You have to admit, that's a less worrying number. It is. Because it's a much less worrying number than 30, 30 just, so you, just so listeners understand, Willie, is that take that roughly 12 trillion, that's intergovernment, including the Fed, um, roughly 12 trillion. So fine, the federal government pays it to the federal government. Okay. So the money comes right back into the federal government. So you're left with the 18 trillion owed. 17 and a half, whatever the number is, owed not by the government to the government. Um, it's a big number, but remember, most of the increase in debt during the pandemic was bought by the Fed. That was intra-government debt. Um, and yes, the Fed technically is an independent agency, blah, 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 blah. But all their net revenue and all their net liabilities and so forth go to the government. So am I worried at 18 trillion? Well, 18 trillion is 60% of GDP, 64% of GDP. Um, we could pay it off with uh, eight months of our work is another way of saying it, right? If we took everything we earned in the next eight months, we could pay off real debt. Can we afford it? Of course we can afford it. Um, I've always said the issue is not can we afford it, is are we getting our money's worth? That's the real issue. The real issue is are we getting our money's worth? But think about it. Um, GDP is like 24 trillion, okay? Round number. Um, you do the present value of that GDP you know, into perpetuity, not just next year, but the kids who are unborn yet and all the ideas yet to come up. You know, you're $800 trillion. What's an extra trillion here or there if it's really well spent? If it's really well spent, it's nothing. If it's badly spent, it's staggering, right? It's staggering. And I just always have thought people focus on the wrong thing. They focus on the number rather than did we get the money's worth for that number. So talking about money and having a lot of money, you in the in the Lineman letter point out the data from Q1 uh, per prequin as it relates to the number of funds out raising money for commercial real estate. And I and I put out the stat earlier of the the Savile stat of $811 billion of global private equity capital waiting to be invested in commercial real estate. And Chris Mickelson's comment, which I thought was great about his great comment. Uh, but uh, in Q1, 2,035 real estate funds were in the market seeking half a trillion dollars of capital. Uh, I thought it was interesting that the breakdown there, value add 31% of the fundraising that's out in the market right now, uh, opportunistic 26%. 
core 15% and debt funds 15%. Um, And if anyone goes and does that math on it, there is a gap there that I other is other strategies, I'm assuming. Or Um, mixed strategies, mixed strategies. Mixed strategies. But you point out that only 92 funds close on 23 billion in capital in Q1 of 23, the lowest since Q1 2013. Right. Isn't now exactly the time when capital ought to be investing in commercial real estate? Well, based on my analysis of history, yes. Um, I don't know that history repeats itself. I would guess it does. The reason I believe history repeats itself is it's a capital intensive business. And if you've got capital and courage, when capital and courage are in short supply, markets normalize, give them a few years, they normalize, and your capital and courage pays off. And that's what my research shows, not just my intuition, but my research shows. Um, What's the problem? The problem is uh, most people don't want to do contrarian, right? Most people follow the flow. It's probably the nature of our species. I go to Kenya next next month and you know i'll see the animals and they mostly are herd animals right they basically follow the herd and there is safety in the herd most of the time not all the time but most of the time and i think investors are kind of herd like their incentives are a bit herd like you don't get you know rewarded tremendously uh, as an institution for taking away from the herd risks so, yeah, it is the time, but it's, it's when people are most hesitant. That's why it turns out to be the time if you have that capital and courage. Look, again, I go, I'm 72. I've seen a lot of markets. You're a young kid. You've seen quite a few markets. That Say, that again. Say that again. Say that again, please. Tell, tell this 56 year old he's a young kid. I love hearing that. Yeah, well, give it, give it, you know, give it 20 years, your hair will look like mine. Um, uh, but no, when you think about it, in, in moments when there's lender strikes, for example, you think it'll never end. It'll never end. In early 2010, it felt like this will never end. In early 1990, 91, 92, it felt like it would never end. And then come back three, four years later, and you're awash with money. And you've got to be able, if you can get in when there's not money and stick around until it's awash with money, you do well on a capital intensive asset. And, but you got to be a little patient. It's not a flip. Um, it, it's, and you got to focus on decent real estate because you got to get to the other side. I was really interested in one stat that you put in, which was that over the trailing 12 months through Q1 of 2023, domestic investors acquired $580 billion of U.S. commercial real estate and non-U.S. investors only acquired $40 billion. I think there's a, there's a, there's a, headline somewhere in commercial real estate right now that like there's all this foreign capital that's coming to the U.S. commercial real estate industry. But over a trailing 12 number of foreign buyers, it's only 7% went to foreign and, buyers. Now, there's- And clearly, it's down. It was up to one point, something like 24%, some number like that at one point. And um, is that is that just due to- um, I mean, is that due to to, to the dollar foreign currency exchange rate? Is that due to value in other markets? What's your why is that such a low number? I I think part is that a lot of countries are still struggling, right? Are still struggling. There's not much money coming out of China at this point, probably as much for political reasons as economic reasons, or more for political reasons than economic. There's no money coming legitimately out of Russia at this point, and it's not like Russia was big, when you go to places like Germany and so what I just got back from, they're kind of focused on themselves and their own problems right now. And um, I still think the U.S. economy is the most attractive place to be for almost all investments. And finally, I said for years and years and years and years, you, I believe in being exposed to foreign markets, but I don't have to go 
to the Turkish stock exchange to be exposed to Turkey's economy. I can own shares of Microsoft on the New York exchange. I can own shares of Apple. I can own shares of Disney. They have exposure to Turkey in their business so that we have these companies that have exposure to international and I don't have to take the vagaries of investing in those exchanges. And the Wall Street Journal finally had an article that kind of tumbled to what's been obvious to me for a long time. So uh, look, if you had money, I, I don't know where else I'd put it. You want to go to Mexico? I don't think so. You want to go to Brazil? I don't think so. You want to go to Chile or Peru? I don't think so. Uh, Canada's struggling uh, a bit more than us. You, Western Europe's killing themselves on the energy altar. Um, uh, Great Britain can't get out of its way. Um, Africa is non-transparent, can't get into China very effectively. We're running out of places. Australia's small, New Zealand's smaller. You, you, you and I were on an email chain yesterday with our friend Mark Ganzi at uh, yeah. Digital Bridge talking about India and about the fact that India is like the, uh, what, do, what do you call it, Hotel California. Once you check in, you can never check back out. Yeah. Uh, so India, you know, it's interesting. I did some work about 15, 10, 15 years ago um, for some Indian families in India. Um, and I came to the conclusion, and this is overly glib, there's a staggering amount of money to be made in India, in real estate. There's a staggering amount of money that's going to be made um, and has been made. I also don't think it's, a lot of it's going to be made by people outside of India. They'll use our capital if they can get it, but we're not going to make a lot of money. They're going to make a lot of money. They control the keys to the kingdom. And so I think what people do with an economy like India is see the opportunity. How can you not identify the opportunity? That isn't the issue. It's how can somebody like us or the people watching this literally access it and execute it and exit it in the ways that they're used to doing? And the answer is can't do. So let's um, let's run through a bunch of the asset classes that you uh, go over. Um, I'm not going to dive too much into the. You've got that great chart, Peter, that shows the development pipeline by city by asset class that allows people to get a sense of sort of where you might be having some oversupply issues. Um, but on multifamily, I'll quote you: the multifamily sector is fundamentally strong, but many markets have aggressive supply pipelines. Um, you think the weakest multifamily markets by the end of 24 are going to be Jacksonville, Salt Lake City, Raleigh, Durham, San Antonio, and Nashville, while the strongest will be New York, San Diego, Boston, Orange County, and Seattle. Um, any rhyme or reason to that, or is that just a it's, it's real simple city analysis? Supply. It's real simple. Just supply and demand. You can't demand. just look at supply, and you can't just look at demand. And of course, as you know, what a lot of people like to do is just look at demand growth. And if all you do is look at demand growth, you're going to be misled. You got to look at demand and supply growth. And so what we're trying to do and the way we get to those is we're making an assessment of supply and we're making an assessment of demand. So you can get some cities where there's not what metropolitans where there's not a lot of demand growth, but there's even less supply growth. And you can get cities where there's a lot of demand growth and stunning supply growth. And so you're trying to balance that out. And all I would point, you know this, but I think a lot of people want a demand only answer or a supply only answer. And it is demand and supply that matter. I didn't learn much as an economics student, but I did learn that. So on retail, Peter, um, you like retail. You talk about consumer product, uh, confidence still being strong. It's at 102 with the long-term historic average at 95. Um, and, and you point out, as you've said many, many times before, and we'll repeat it again, you know, you've got $1.7 trillion of, of, of retail sales in Q1. Of that, 1.5 is brick and mortar and 265 billion is online. So online's right now at about 15%. And so while everyone yep. 
everyone signs off and says, no, it's, it's, it's all going to Amazon. It's actually not the case. And one of the things that you point out in the letter is that all of your covered retail markets will be in balance in Q, were in balance in Q1 2023 and expected to remain so through 2024. So you're you're very bullish on retail. It's simple. It's as simple as this: no supply being added, and in fact, in some markets, net destruction. Right? That 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 center finally went out of business. There's no new supply being added to speak of, and there's demand growth because there's income growth. Right? How can you not like it? Now, does that mean I like every retail center? Of course no, not. Right. There's some really crappy ones I hate, but that just means I really like the good ones even more. Um, it's it, no supply growth. So your projections on hospitality have been right on the mark, right on the mark. Um, you, you, you said we'll be back. Uh, close to the same occupancy level at this time as we were in February of 2020, and we're about 3% below on an occupancy level. Our rev par is up to $93.60 is average rev, rev par, which has not quite caught up to where it was uh, pre-pandemic, but it's on track to be there as you had projected by the end of 2023, and it's up on a T12 basis 16%. Um, the one other point that you've made a number of times is that the Chinese citizen has not gotten back to travel. And I keep sitting there going, someone's going to make a ton of money investing in hospitality in markets that the Chinese population has totally agree. And to go to go hit. And I saw the thing about Disney and Disney numbers being down dramatically, but there's a lot to be made here on the hospitality front if people have the right markets and, and can I can identify that consumer base. No? Two, two parts. Let's just say your number like 3% is right, 3% below four years ago. But it's more than that, Willie, because if we were to talk four years ago to people and, and we'd have followed the data, you'd have said, okay, and in four years, it'll be 5 to 7% higher. So not only is it 3% below 2019, it's like 10% below where the economics and demographics would have it. Huge pent-up demand, huge pent-up demand domestically, huge pent-up demand Europe. Then you go to China, and China is back to traveling a decent amount within China, but not much out, outside of China. They're going to come back. And I don't know if it's next summer or two summers, but when they do, look, you remember being in Times Square or being in D.C., even Philadelphia. Uh, over at Independence Hall, we saw huge numbers in 2018, 19. They're going to come back. And when they do, you're right. Domestic demand is going to get back and, um, and, and foreign demand. Um, it, there's, there's just huge pent up demand. And that's one of the reasons I'm so bullish on the economy. We have pent up demand for travel and tourism. We have pent up demand for automobiles. We have pent up demand for healthcare. by the way. You know, that all you have to do is look at the healthcare data. And clearly, a lot of people did not go get their health taken care of like they would have normally done during the pandemic. We got a lot of pent up activity associated with that. So I feel good about hospitality and supply. There's not much being built. So you got a sector with not much being built and pretty identifiable good demand. So um, we're, we're almost out of time. So in, in closing, here's what I want to ask you. Um, We've gotten the inflation print that you had projected that we were going to get. Uh, the ten-year, I, as I checked before uh, this, uh, we started three eighty-five when I last checked. Who knows whether it's gone up a little bit or down a little bit? Um, between now and our next call, you own a diversified portfolio of commercial real estate assets. Yeah. What, are you, what are you doing? Um, basically, I'd hold, and I'd probably be buying apartments on Wall Street. You know, I'd be buying apartments you know, through the REITs only because it's more actionable quickly, right? It's, it's more actionable quickly. Um, if I had capital available, I would be trying to do apartment development. I'd be trying to do industrial development. 
Why? Because I think by the time I really start drawing down my construction loan, interest rates are going to be a lot lower than I pro forma. And I think the project turns out a lot better than I think. And there's going to be an, up to the oddity of the data we were just talking about. There's going to be a little gap out there in two years. Um, I'd be sitting cautious on office. I'd stay where I'm at on hospitality. Uh, and then I'd stay where I'm at on, on um, um, retail. So our next Walker webcast with you is in New York. So maybe you and I go check out some of those Wall Street apartment buildings that you think that we ought to go invest in together. No, uh, no, no I meant not Wall Street that way. I meant REITs, right? Meant Buying REITs. the REITs uh, because that's uh, very actionable. Okay. Right. I was sitting in there words, trying to figure words, out which apartment building you wanted the two of us to go invest no, in. No, no, like no. 42nd in Madison. I meant, yeah. Well, good catch. Good clarification. I meant uh, right now I would probably just do the apartment REITs. Um, but if I could find apartment complexes, I would do them. But it's less instantly actionable is all I meant. Got it. Got it. Um, well, I very much look forward to seeing you in October. Um, safe travels to Kenya. Um, you do great, great work. And anybody who reads the Lineman letter, Peter outlines all of the wonderful work his foundation does over in Africa uh, to help the communities where he focuses. So uh, to any of you who want to be generous there, it's a it's a wonderful cause. Uh, Peter, as always, I, I got 15 other questions I could ask you. I got, I got so many notes. I, I may have to call you after this and finish up on my own on my own discussion. But anyway, thanks. It's great, as always, to everyone who joined us today. Thanks. Have a great week. And we'll be back next week with Carol Sokolov in a conversation about the broader capital markets and not just commercial real estate. Thanks, Peter.